Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Economic Development Commission for Friday, November 3rd. Um, I know we've got some guests here who we're looking forward to hearing from in a little bit. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to review the minutes from our October 6th meeting. Um, entertain any changes or edits if anyone has them. Otherwise, I uh, would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, so we'll jump right in. I know the last meeting we had, I think there had not been a land use liaison meeting or the timing cadence was a little bit off. So we haven't still no, no we have, we have one today. We have a loaded agenda at 9 a.m. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll look forward to a hearty uh, report out in December. Hearty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right, thank you. Well, then we'll, we'll jump to Ben and the Chamber Collaborative. Awesome. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it uh, seems uh, remarkably busy for this time of year. Normally, it wouldn't be so busy, but uh, a lot going on. So I'll just highlight a few things. Um, Restaurant Week has started, uh, kicked off yesterday, uh, goes through uh, this uh, coming following Saturday. Um, so hopefully, uh, you have a chance to get out there and dine. There's 28 participating restaurants uh, this year. We held our kickoff event at the Wilder. Um, uh, really fun, fun afternoon. Um, uh, what was that? That was Wednesday of this week. So. Um, very excited about that. Um, uh, also, earlier this week on, on Monday, we held our annual um, awards event. This is uh, normally we give out those awards at Street Life, but um, we actually really like separating the two. Um, uh, the Street Life is a, a very fun event, um, but it, uh, it's a hard place to get people's attention and really. Um, um, you know, sort of give the attention that these award recipients deserve um, and highlight them in an appropriate way. So we uh, were able to uh, honor um, the Small But Mighty Business of the Year as New Hampshire Art Association, mm -hmm. the Large Business of the Year as uh, the J Hospitality Group, mm -hmm. which is really a collection of small businesses in and of itself. Um, our Volunteer of the Year was Josh Leonard from Calling All Cargo, who's a, a great young guy. Um, Collaborator of the Year was Latanya Wallace, a friend to many around the table. Um, and then we um, uh, we always create an award every year because we can and why not. Um, and, and we uh, honored the the 400th this year with the Lighting Our Way Award. So the Portsmouth NH 400 team, um, we were able to honor them, um, and we were very excited to do so. Uh, next week, um, there's more awards. I don't know. It's like award season. Is that like a Hollywood thing? I think. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we have a, a new event on, on Wednesday of next week, which is the eighth. Um, it's a, another luncheon. It'll be at Atlantic Grill um, called Celebrate Her, celebrating our, our, our female uh, business leaders, our women business leaders in our community. Uh, we are going to be honoring four um, amazing um, women business leaders, and we're also going to be honoring um, and celebrating three uh, high school um, young ladies that are just phenomenal, and, and through uh, Courtney Richings that we all know at the CTE program, uh, she was able to connect us with three just amazing young women that we can bring there. Um, and we're going to provide them with some mentorship and hopefully some uh, scholarship dollars as well. Um, so we're really excited about that. That's a new thing for us uh, um, at the chamber, and we're, we're really um, couldn't be happier to bring that to uh, the table. Um, it's also a uh, political season, um, not only here at First City Council elections, and we held some candidate forums, which were, um, I don't think, fun for anyone, except maybe sort of the people that attended. Um, I don't know. Uh, we got to rethink how we do that a little bit. But we they, they happened, and they were well attended, and um, there was a lot of great discussion. So I guess they were productive. I'm not sure they were enjoyable. but. Yeah. Um, and uh, but we're also working on our policy um, just uh, in general uh, our, our policy recommendations for state uh, level issues so that's something we do every fall um, and, uh, and and presented at a January um, elected <coughs> officials reception um, so we're working on that now in fact I have to go to Concord today to testify to a committee on uh, hospitality and tourism education needs in the state of New Hampshire uh, Oh, see you there. Oh, cool. All right. There you go. Uh, so uh, I think that's the highlights of stuff going on. Oh, uh, a couple other things now that I think about it. Um, we have mentioned that uh, we're trying to support our retail community, and I just want to update you on those efforts. I um, almost forgot all about it, Sean. Uh, but Sean and I have been working very closely on this, and Sean's probably sick of me by now. Uh, but uh, we are, are we are going to be working with the city to keep the streets of, uh, of the Market Square footprint, um, Market Square Day footprint closed um, after the parade this year on the, the 2nd of December. 
I think that's the right date. Uh, yeah. Um, to, uh, to have a, a downtown uh, walkabout, uh, sip and, uh, and shop kind of event where you can go store to store. Uh, we're going to have uh, carolers and, and uh, other kind of fun things going on. Sean's working on eggnog. We might have a beer garden somewhere. We, you've got Jen that's going to be on the on the, the tunes. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have you know, magicians roaming the street. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a, a great evening that night to uh, have a lot of people come downtown and shop and, and uh, just kind of kick that season off in a big way for our retail community. Very excited about that. Um, there was something else I was going to mention, but it's escaped my mind, and we'll just... <coughs> Is he are you going to talk about the economic forum, or you yeah. want me to? Okay, good. I'll let you do that one. Well, I missed half of it, so why don't you go ahead and Okay, uh, so earlier this week, uh, I don't even know what day. It's been a busy week. Um, Wednesday, I think it was. Uh, the state uh, economic, uh, the BEA, Business and Economic Affairs Office um, for the state, um, held uh, for the first time in, in my time um, a statewide uh, forum, if you will, of all economic developers and chambers and uh, the Cedars and Regional Planning Commission folks. Everyone was there um, talking about how um, uh, providing a lot of information. Um, there's a really great report that was given out that shares um, what our strengths are um, by region in the state. So they've broken the state up into these four cedar groups. Don't ask me what that stands for because I don't know. Um, but these four cedar groups, um, and they, so they drill down to the seacoast cedar and they tell us what our strengths are locally, what our weaknesses are locally, wh um, what's our labor rate participation, uh, wh what's, what's our wages, what, all, everything, our education levels, all this and that stuff. Really great information um, drilled right down to the seacoast. Um, their definition of seacoast is pretty big comparatively to what we would normally use here, uh, but still great information. And then uh, our, our, our work group, our cedar group for the, the seacoast was able to get together and spend some time um, with that information and talking about how we can better partner regionally uh, to support everyone's economic development efforts. Uh, so a lot of conversation around housing, a lot of conversation around transportation, a lot of conversation about how um, our cedar, and there's four of these around the state, is really performing at a very high level because um, we, were, we were doing this well before the state formalized it into these cedars. This, these groups were meeting pretty regularly beforehand, met weekly during COVID, um, and now it's going to, uh, I think, a monthly meeting at this point. Um, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of great stuff there. I, I would love to um, synthesize that and share some, some highlights with this group, um, but it's like a report yay thick, and I haven't quite gone through it yet. So maybe at a future time, we can share some of those updates between Sean and I. Um, but uh, it was a really great uh, event and, and, and meeting uh, on a beautiful fall day in Plymouth. So it was great. That's awesome. Ben, is that book, is it just a physical book or is there a deck that they... No, I believe you can download it yeah, through the I made, I made a note to download it yeah. and send it. I'll, I'll distribute it to the group. That would be yeah. great. be good to take a look at that before we get together in January. Yeah, some of the statistics I think would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's it for me. Thank Thanks, you. Ben. Thanks. Busy is the right word. Yeah, in a week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So next we've got Sean. I want to go next so I can remember what to fill in the blanks on. So a CEDAR is a cooperative economic development region. There you go. And, and the Seacoast, we're, we're one of them. And to Ben's point, uh, you all have heard me talk about this regional effort where we get together regularly. I get together regularly with the economic development folks from <coughs> Rochester, Exeter, Dover. Uh, Ben's there, other chamber members, other regional planning commissions. It's, it's a, it could be 30 or 40 people on a Zoom. And we, we talk about all the time. So really, we call that SEDS, which is the Seacoast Economic Development Stakeholders. Uh, and um, the state just kind of liked it so much, they put a new name on it, and they asked the rest of the regions around the state to do it. And it's, and it's great. It's fine. We get... Um, we got some support from the state. We got some, some ARPA dollars they had left over. You might recall I've, I've talked about the workforce development, workforce education process or program we put together for, for small employers. Um, that's something that came directly to our Seacoast Cedar from the state to spend those dollars. And um, actually it's been such a success that um, there was a presentation made to Commissioner Caswell a couple of weeks ago. Of course, he'd like to push what we did around the state and um, our, our goal is to then get funding for next year to do another project since we uh, hit it out of the park, according to Commissioner as well. Um, so that's what the CEDA was, and with the Economic Development uh, Economic Forum, there were, there were the folks who were there from 
Community Develop Development Finance Authority. There was a lot of folks on the panel, your you, um, USNH, the University System of New Hampshire, the community colleges, just everyone talking about workforce, about housing, about how to support our employers. So a lot of good information, nothing really earth shattering per se, but um, the, the one thing that came out of it was, was collaboration, was really trying to break down walls between whether it's um, the Community Development Finance Authority or New Hampshire Employment Services, all the things that the state wants to continue to do, but the, the commission was very clear that these will not be driven by the state, they will not be mandated by the state, but he's trying to just convene people and convene organizations to look at how they do business differently to collaborate. So I think the good news is, is that's just a natural way we operate on the seacoast, um, but we, we can always challenge ourselves to do more. So to button that up, that was the economic forum. Um, the, the event, the post parade event, <laughs> which we're modeling after art around town to hopefully be shop around town, um, that's gonna be put uh, in front of city council to make sure we can do that. But Ben and I have really been doing the legwork to, to line it up, make sure we can keep the streets closed. Uh, and then um, there's a couple of vendors who, who, may, who are gonna ask for permission to either serve eggnog or potentially set up a beer garden. So that's, that's the typical process of, of a company asking the city for permission to do that. What we're doing is making sure the space is safe for pedestrians and inviting and fun. So I just want to be clear because it's a little bit, it's a new thing, mm. hopefully it'll go on uh, in the future, but it's an opportunity to have all those folks downtown after the parade and keep them there a little longer and show them just another side and really focus on retail, really focus on supporting our retailers. So just to put a finer point on that. Um, other than that, back to economic development here, um, it's arts, all arts, all the time. The after report has come out, it looks like the, the um, economic impact to the seacoast or to greater portion is gonna be higher than it was six years ago. I still can't say the number, it's gonna be coming out shortly. Um, but if you recall the number last six years ago was $58 million impact. So it's gonna be north of that number, which is just interesting right? because we had that and then we had COVID and then we, and now we're back to where we are. And, and I think you've heard Ben talk about it's been a good summer. It's been a good summer for hospitality. It's been a good summer for, for restaurants and, and for some of the arts and culture venues. Not, not all of them, but m I would say most. Um, so in terms of visitors and um, supporting our arts and culture community, we're there. So on top of the art after results coming out, we have the, um, the cultural plan, which is into phase three, which is basically the consultants are going to work with the um, Cultural Planning Subcommittee, which, which I work with, and we're gonna write the four, we're gonna focus on the four or five themes that came out of all the focus groups, and then put some, put some action steps to that, such that the plan is to deliver a cultural plan to the City Council at the last City Council meeting in December. Um, so, how, you know, how that intersects us is we know it's a big part of our economy, we know it's a big part of our community, and we'll have this plan in place, we'll have the AFTA information, and you'll recall that the City Council set up an Arts and Culture Commission, so that is being, um, if people are applying for that now, and so that hopefully we start in January with a full commission to take that plan forward and to, there's just a lot going on around arts. People have started calling me the arts guy, have to remind them I'm the economic development. <laughs> <laughs> and arts guy, <laughs> uh, but there's a lot there and I just want to keep this group certainly plugged into that because it's a big part uh, of our economy. Um, speaking of the, the BEA and the, and the dollars they gave us, we are, Ben and I are working on an event on Tuesday, December 5th, like an 8 a.m. start at, at Seacoast Rep. That should be finalized shortly where we're gonna present um, the program that, that I've talked about, and I think I've shared with you all about attracting, uh, attracting, developing, attracting, retaining, and developing employees, and it's a, it's kind of a employer toolkit. We'll have the uh, the, 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 the local Seco or Portsmouth firm that put it together. They're going to do a panel with some folks that are using those the toolkit, and hopefully engage some employers in the audience in how to actually 
go from, oh, that's really cool, to how can I use that in my business to help myself grow? So that's coming on December 5th. And uh, that's what I have. That December 5th event, is that like cross industry? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thanks. More to come. Great. Another busy update, so we'll <coughs> jump to our city councilors. Um, I'll start. I, I wanted one of the things that was discussed briefly at the last meeting was uh, reporting back on things that <coughs> most people see in the newspaper and most, you know. Um, People are, are kind of aware of what the city council does. I think most of did. Uh, so I guess my thought on that was that it might be better to try to think forward rather than backward. And so I'm just, what I want to say is that, you know, we have coming up in, in the next year is the uh, master plan uh, is going to be a significant thing that the council is going to face. Um, always, always the capital improvement plan, always the budget, um, and um, so I, I just, I, I just wanted to bring those things up. I'm going to let Joanna um, do do the rest of the, the report of what she thinks. Um, I do want to say that I sent the um, the report that uh, Judy Belanger gave to the council to the chair and hopefully deliver it to the rest of the council. Um, an amazing report on the finances and how the finances actually work for the city. Um, uh, so there's been in. There's been some misinformation about um, that, and uh, she lays it out pretty well. So it's a, it's a good report, and um, look look for that in your inboxes. Uh, anyway. Okay. Yes. Um, so to get down to some of the other little things, we had a couple uh, first readings on some updates. Our governance committee has been working really hard on updating some of our ordinances, including. Um, uh, our ethics and uh, election disclosure ordinances and also um, as some of you may know uh, making some of the committees that have been blue ribbon committees standing committees uh, a big one of that is like the sustainability committee uh, so making sure that you know some of the things that we we have in the books make sense um, they're also looking into things like should we have a um, you know, green space and parks committee, or should that go somewhere else? And so the governance committee is doing a lot, and so we reported back on that. Uh, we had, sorry, I'm just going through my notes. Um, uh, we a big, um, <clears throat> a, a not big change, but a change that all residents should be aware of is the change to our snow removal um, updates. Uh, so we're asking everyone to um, download a, a Smart Nine One One. Um, but we're, we're kind of changing kind of the dynamic of, of how that information is delivered. It will still obviously be on the paper. It will still be um, easily accessible, but really trying to streamline, again, that processy uh, at the request of, of, of staff and moving forward. Um, obviously, the big one that we should mention is that the election is next Tuesday, November 7th. Um, Obviously, every resident should go out and vote if they're eligible. Uh, last year, we had one of the highest turnouts, but it was still only in the, in the mid-30%. Uh, we have around 16,000 people that are eligible, and only around um, you know, 6,000 people end up voting in the municipal election. Uh, so if you have any questions, to go see Kelly Barnaby at our city clerk's office. She's really amazing. They've been holding uh, voter registration uh, events around town, kind of getting out into the public. Um, as Ben said, we've we've had all uh, the forums, and so a lot of those. Well, uh, WSCA can be found on their website. Uh, Channel 22 is replaying the uh, one that we had downtown, but they're all put on by uh, community groups. Uh, so if you are part of a neighborhood association uh, or just a group of people and you want to put on a forum, I like to let people know that they can. That is like within their right as a resident. Um, so that's kind of. <laughs> really, and you'll start seeing some of the pilot traffic, uh, traffic and safety programs coming coming up. 
um, you know, some of the the calming initiatives in neighborhoods as we prepare for uh, the winter season. Um, and that is being heavily discussed in traffic and safety. So I like to remind people uh, to try to watch those meetings or attend those meetings or email that committee if you have any questions or concerns with any of the measures that are potentially outside of your neighborhood and you don't understand why they're happening. Um, I think that's kind of, so we have uh, our next meeting. Oh, big one. Our next meeting is <clears throat> the 13th and before that meeting we'll have a uh, a public work session about we will get a presentation from the police department um, working group uh, that is assessing whether a new facility or update of the facility. So this will be the first time that that uh, committee and the council are in one room together discussing the possibilities of either a new site or revamping of this site uh, and kind of what you know their perspectives of their needs are. So I'm heavily asking the community this is you know the time to throw yourselves into the into the process. Uh, it's really important as we look at the endeavor of, you know, 20 to 50 million dollar project. Um, kind of figuring out what that means for our community, what it means for other capital investment uh, projects, um, and really kind of looking at, at it in a big, at a big way. Um, for me, I just want to um, point out, some of you may know, some of you may don't know, but I'm the, uh, somehow, the advisor at the business club at the high school. So for our next meeting, they will be part of that when we are at the, um, at the, the CTE uh, at, the, at the high school. So I'm excited for you to meet those kids. Um, and if one of the things that we are going to be starting to do there is we are rejoining FBLA, uh, which is for those of you who don't know is Future Business Leaders of America. So we will be competing on a state and hopefully national level with the kids are really, really excited about. Uh, the other thing that I'm bringing into them is speakers. Uh, so if anyone in this group would like to come or anyone out in the public, uh, we're starting to line those up for January. And so it's just a Tuesday afternoon for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, just getting speakers in there within industries uh, that the kids are really interested in. Um, yeah, I think that's really. Just make sure you vote on November seventh. Go for it. Well, I was going to ask you if uh, any of the new ordinances dealing with ethics or that type of thing would apply to this commission. Is there anything we need to know? Uh, no, it's 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 really just kind of cleaning up some of the. Um, what, I guess what the governance committee would consider gaps, um, but everything that is going through currently passed uh, will not take effect until um, January. No, no. But I, I, in January, uh, is there yes. a new set of yes, yes, you know, so disclosures yes. will apply to well, okay. commissions, committees, um, <coughs> yes, staff, council. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a pretty broad. Uh, Great. All right. So. Um, Maybe you could coordinate with sure. Vince or Joanna and see if we can get copies so we can distribute them it's, by January. Yeah. We, yes. Okay. Great. Thanks, Sean. So if I could just add on, um, I appreciate uh, Council Lombardi's looking forward, uh, and you've, you've all have heard me talk about this, but we also have a climate action plan that's go that's going on right now, working with a consultant. Um, there's a Market Square Master Plan, which is a smaller version of the Master Plan. Uh, I'm, I'm making sure that I participate on that group. You've heard me talk about the parking study that was underway and looking at that. Um, I mentioned the cultural plan and then this economic data. So there's a lot of information and a lot of things in play. And what occurred to me um, when Vince, Councilor Lombardi was speaking was, be great for this group to look at some of those things as we go into a meeting in January to talk about how we're going how we're going to focus our the EDC how you all are going to focus your efforts uh, for next year because there's just a lot going on here that's going to happen whether the EDC is engaged or not so I, I think it's full of opportunity maybe too many opportunities so we may have to choose but I, I certainly leave this to you guys but I wanted to remind you there's a lot of plans and information out there that's great. Thanks, Sean. <coughs> My only other question for the counselors would be, um, have you seen or uh, been given any indication on timeline for the outdoor dining ordinance draft that we should be aware of or prepared to answer any follow-up questions if that's brought back before the council? 
Do you have no, any? it's it's <clears throat> it's at legal right now, and our our hope is that it will be back to us by for um, by the end of this year. Sure. I, so I think we've we've missed the boat on the on the. Yes. I was in a meeting yesterday. I think it's going to be ready for the next council meeting. Okay. Oh, right? It was it was deferred to legal for review, <clears throat> and legal is is I believe they're just about done, ninety nine percent, and there's been. I've been, just been in meetings to make sure that I'm um, maintaining the EDC position and listening from a business perspective, and I, I think it's going pretty well. But um, they're pushing hard to get it on to get on it the on next the agenda. Yeah, November 13th. The 13th. Okay, November 13th. Yes. Yeah. Which the deadline to get it on the agenda is next Tuesday. Yes. So <laughs> we'll keep an eye out for that, but yeah, it could be more to. Yeah, watch for that agenda. I'll, I'll certainly let you all know that if it gets on there and it's there, ready to go. So then you can take a look at it. Perfect. Thanks, John. Thanks, counselors. So uh, that's all we have on the front end of our agenda before we welcome uh, Gino Marconi, the uh, director of the Port Authority. Gino, welcome. Thanks Morning, for joining. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. If you don't mind, I'll go stand by Sean over there. So you want to come sit see. here or you? Okay. Yeah. I want to yeah. sit here. No, right in the middle. Everybody wants to sit anywhere. I have my name tag. I'll just poke Sean to advance the. Uh, did PowerPoint. you? When did you send that to me? Oh, I sent it to you. Gino, I was thinking about that this morning when I came in. I don't remember. It was a couple of three weeks ago. Oh. Okay, bear bear with me. All good. Do you want to introduce your Yeah, I'll, your I'll start well? in. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you. Members of the uh, commission, thank you for the opportunity to come in here today. I would like to briefly take an opportunity to introduce uh, two associates that I have with me this morning. Um, Miles Greenway is our new assistant port director. He's in day three. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, please don't scare him away. And then uh, also with me is Tom Masiello, who is uh, on loan to us with from the United States Coast Guard. He's a petty officer through a program called Skill Bridge. Um, very interesting uh, relationship with the Coast Guard that we have, and uh, Tom's been uh, with us now for five months. So. Um, so anyways, um, while well, Sean's looking. Um, Frantically. So the New Hampshire Port Authority was a standalone state agency that was established in 1957. And in 2001, the legislature merged us administratively with the Pease Development Authority. It was a small agency. There were only like five people working there. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. and. Uh, by merging us administratively with PEAS, we are a separate entity under the blanket of PEAS, uh, but it gave us a lot of uh, resources that we didn't have previously. Uh, the Attorney General's office is our legal counsel of record, but we have access to the legal counsel over at PEAS, engineering department, most importantly, our finance department. Um, we get, you know, it, it, there's so many layers of oversight over the finances there that uh, it's really uh, reassuring to know that we're on a, on a level basis with our finances. So as we proceeded along uh, over the next couple of years after that, the state also gave us other responsibilities. They turned over the Portsmouth Fish Pier on Pierce Island to us and the facilities at Ryan Hampton. So generally, uh, our responsibilities, our area responsibility are the tidal waters of the state of New Hampshire. Uh, goes all the way up to the dam in Exeter, New Market, Durham, and all the way up to the dam in uh, South Berwick. Uh, we're responsible for the permitting and the placement of all of the moorings in the tidal waters. And uh, there are 1,500 moorings, so there are 1,500 different stories that we deal with every day on, on that basis. Um, we're also responsible for the licensing uh, of, of the state pilots to bring the ships into the rivers. Uh, this is under federal regulation of federal pilotage area, and um, so a merchant mariner, if he meets the qualifications to take the test, he can get uh, an endorsement on his federal license to be a pilot in the Scattaquah River up to Dover Point. 
However, under federal law, the local authority, that being the state of New Hampshire, who put that responsibility on us, has the ability to make uh, more restrictive, as long as they're non-conflicting regulations governing state licensed pilots. Uh, because of the unique geographic and physical uh, characteristics of the Piscataqua River, there's a big difference. Federal pilotage, you make five, uh, 12 round trips, two of which are in the dock. That qualifies you to take the test, and the test is pretty unique because they give you a blank piece of paper and you have to draw the chart of the Piscataqua River from out by the lighthouse up to Dover Point uh, from memory, putting in depth, water depths, bearings to physical uh, um, uh, points on the land. <laughs> In order for someone to become a pilot in the Piscataqua River, a state pilot, they first have to have that federal endorsement. So second, um, under our regulations, that, pi that person has to make 100 round trips, 25 of them in the dark, under the tutelage of an already licensed state pilot. Um, and then when they submit their papers to us uh, for consideration, they have to have a letter of reference from a state pilot saying that they believe that they're qualified to do that. Uh, we currently have three pilots. Uh, in fact, we just, um, a couple of months ago, the PDA appointed a new, a new pilot. Uh, so um, uh, we have Captain Chris Holt and Captain Richard Holt, their cousins, their fourth generation in the harbor. And uh, we just appointed uh, Captain Chip, uh, Vincent Chip Tessetta. Uh, the Tessetta family is from Portsmouth, um, and, and Chip's been on the water since he was a young boy, and he's got quite a, quite a background and a good set of credentials. Um, so one last thing I'll, before I talk about the facilities here in Portsmouth is uh, the Port Authority is the grantee in the state of New Hampshire under the U.S. Department of Commerce Foreign Trade Zones Board to be the grantee in New Hampshire to have a foreign trade zone uh, project. Um, we've, we've gone through some uh, metamorphosis with this over the last few years, uh, and it started, it's starting to get uh, more um, more people interested in it, businesses interested in it. A lot of it started when there was all of the terminology in the newspaper, the uh, tariff wars between the United States and some other countries. Uh, there was a lot of interest, uh, and, and, and when that started to wane, the interest waned. But uh, we've got some pretty good success stories in the state. Uh, one of the longest ones we have operating is a company over in Jaffrey. It's a Millipore Corporation. They make high-tech uh, water filtration systems for the biotech industry. They currently employ 935 people over there, and they're doing an expansion about ready to employ another 500 people. Uh, there's a company down in uh, Nashua that uses it, uh, and right here in Portsmouth, out at Pease, uh, Rochester Electronics, uh, an importer of uh, electronic devices uh, that uses it. So. Uh, Probably the most evident thing that everyone sees in the city of Portsmouth when you come in on Market Street is the Market Street Marine Terminal. It's, a 12, it's 12 acres of property that was bought in 1960 from the Boston and Maine Railroad. A little sliver of it was bought from uh, Standard Oil and uh, over where the Isles of Shoals Steamship Company was bought from uh, a gentleman named uh, Barker who owned a, a machine shop company. Uh, there's a long history behind that property. In colonial days, it was a codfish drying facility, which is why everyone came to the seacoast area anyways. Uh, and then it morphed into uh, shipbuilding in the 1700s. In the 1800s, the railroad came in there, and, uh, and then uh, Standard Oil was in there. They had a presence in there. And uh, when uh, the Boston and Maine Railroad went bankrupt, the property just kind of laid fallow and uh, the state the state bought it um, and it was in 1964 that the first part of the development <clears throat> came along and um, uh, the state constructed a 300 foot long uh, concrete berth for a ship um, as we all know uh, ships have increased in size over the years you know uh, you saw when they re when they uh, rebuilt the Sarah Long Bridge 
The bridge was built in 1940, and at that time, the largest vessel going up the river through the bridge was a, a jumbo ice T2 tanker, which was about 524 feet. We now have uh, uh, tug and barge units going up to the oil terminals up there that are 550 feet, and we've got cargo ships going up to Sprague's terminals up there that are 764 feet. Uh, so the bridge, the bridge was a, a great improvement for navigation. But at our facility, um, the second part of the development there was in 1977 when an, an additional 300 feet was added on to the, to the pier and uh, allowed, allowed the Port Authority to uh, attract the larger vessels in, in other cargoes. In about 1967-68, the Port Authority advertised a request for proposals for a terminal operator, and that contract was awarded to a company called John T. Clark Company, a big stevedore company out of Baltimore. And until 1999, they had the exclusive rights to operate that terminal. And the primary cargo that they handled was scrap metal. There was a period of time where there was a small feeder service of containers that operated in and out of there, a feeder service, um, but that sort of that sort of went to the wayside because uh, they decided there wasn't enough traffic to warrant the stops here. Um, so when we came over under uh, the Pease Development Authority, uh, obviously scrap metal was still there. It was a very controversial thing. Um, you know, I grew up in this city, and I, I remember from day one, um, currently, we, well, we do not have scrap metal anymore. Um, the PDA Board of Directors decided it wasn't in the best interest of the community, the harbor, uh, and our facility. Uh, we do have our base, our base tenants there now is uh, road de-icing salt. <coughs> And I'll, exp I'll explain why we have base tenants. We are self-funding. I do not get an operating budget from the state of New Hampshire, and I do not get one penny from the Peace Development Authority. In fact, I pay them for the services that they provide us. So once a month, there's a settlement sheet that goes around to the uh, finance department who does our payroll and everything, the legal department, and anyone keeps track of their time. Um, just like a good attorney does, you know, uh, this is how much time I did uh, work for the Port Authority, and we reimburse them for the, those wages. So, in order for us to uh, keep the facility open and ready to handle uh, cargo that may desire to come in here, we had to have a base tenant. Uh, so, it's been road salt now for the last few years, and that allows us to pay the bills. For the last 20 years, we've looked very hard at what our opportunities are and what our opportunities could be. And they were pretty slim because of the condition of the facility. The part of the pier that was built in 1964 has had very little to no work done on it to maintain it. Just, uh, it, it's been a struggle. I, I applied 12 times to USDOT for different grant programs under Tiger Grants, Build Grants, uh, and we finally got one uh, a couple of three years ago. It was, uh, we had $5 million that had been appropriated by the state back in 1990, and uh, we just used that for leverage against these grant programs. So we got $7.5 million from the um, from the feds. When the bids came in, the bid was to re uh, rehabilitate that facility were higher than what we had, uh, and we went to uh, the governor's office and to the uh, um, finance co uh, committee in the, in the legislature, and they gave us uh, about a million and a half more dollars to, to reach the threshold. So we started that project, and it was uh, to rehabilitate the existing facility and to modify it. So rehabilitating it, um, we put uh, fiberglass jackets around the pilings because our condition survey said that it was still in serviceable uh, condition, but we wanted to extend their life uh, another, you know, more time. 
uh, repair the uh, uh, small concrete that was underneath the pier, uh, hydro demo the deck of the pier and, and put a new surface on it. But for those of you that have ever been down there, when the original pier was built, the original 300 feet, it was built offshore. And they put these two approach bridges out there. And so we had this open water area between me and Sean. And I had to turn away a lot of cargo over the years because we didn't have the ability because that was an obstruction. Uh, we're about finished with the project of driving pylons and decking that over so it's going to all be one big flat piece and we're really excited about our, our opportunities going ahead because um, we've done some small land-based uh, windmill projects and thank God they were small windmills. Uh, the blades were 145 feet but it took a lot of planning to get those blades off of that ship and around the pond to get it out the gate, uh, a lot of backing and filling. With this decked over area now, we'll have direct access from the front gate to the ship, which is going to allow us to move cargo more efficiently. Um, the other night, last Friday uh, morning at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, we moved the, the ghost boat from over at uh, Albacore Park across the street. Um, uh, picked it up with a crane to get it up over the warehouse, put it back on the trailer, but we had to zigzag our way through the uh, terminal to get it down under the dock uh, where it was loaded on a ship on uh, Tuesday morning to go to Portland. Uh, so this is, this is um, really going to be an improvement. It's going to give <coughs> us an opportunity to uh, uh, showcase improvements and uh, bringing our facility back to a state of good repair to, to shippers. Uh, and cargo cargo owners that we get in inquiries about a lot of times, but uh, again we had to turn them away because of the facility. So the next next big thing that's that's on our radar is um, when they built the Sarah Mildred Long Bridge replacement, uh, you'll notice that the bridge was moved a little further up up the river. Uh, the reason they did that was um, there was a navigation improvement a navigation safety improvement study that was published by the United States Coast Guard in 1987. And it listed five projects in the Piscataqua River to improve uh, navigation safety. Uh, removing a piece of ledge down in front of the Kittery Point Yard Club on Goat Island, uh, over by Badgers Island um, when you come around the corner, uh, cutting the ledge back there, uh, putting a, a thousand foot turning basin between the two bridges and a footnote on that is 90 days after that turning basin was completed in 1992 uh, there was a uh, propane tanker that came in and lost its steerage between the two bridges and had the ability to turn it around and take it back out to the anchorage. Um, the fourth project was the uh, expansion of the uppermost turning basin uh, as you approach uh, Dover Point uh, that turning basin was constructed in 1977 and it was an 800 foot turning basin. And as I said earlier, the largest ship coming in up there now is the uh, CSL Metz. She's a, a self unloading uh, boat carrier. She's 765 feet. Uh, pilots have been turning that ship around in an 800 foot turning basin. The economics of that, take the safety part of it out, the economics of it is, is because of the safety concerns, these ships were only allowed to come in at the time of high tide. If the wind was blowing too hot, if the visibility was terrible, uh, the ship had to sit on the, on the anchor out of there. And the longer the ship sits, the longer the cargo sits in the ship, the longer, it, the more it costs to handle that cargo, and the consumer is the one that takes that on the other end. Uh, that project was completed two years ago. And uh, it's it's really made a big difference in the in the uh, traffic in the river and the safety of the traffic. But the fifth project was the replacement of the Sarah Mildred Long Bridge. The, besides the fact that it was old and wasn't in very good condition, the the project that the Corps identified was when it was built in 1940. It was not lined up with the navigation channel in the river. 
So as the pilot would come through this memorial bridge and make the turn along Market Street and, and line up on the bridge, they were looking at the bridge opening like that. It was a 32 degree skew in the, in the angle. Uh, once the pilot shaped up on the hole, the tugboats had to let it go and race through the other side to catch it because the bridge wasn't wide enough. Uh, we were limited to a vessel of 106 feet wide uh, on that Sarah Long Bridge. Um, we've got extremely talented pilots, and I yeah. will say that. Um, in my in my lifetime here, I, I I only know of one elision that took place many years ago where I uh, just made a, a scrape on it, uh, on the bridge above it. But, so what they did was is they took the New Hampshire side approach and they moved it up river and it reduced that angle from 32 degrees down to 13 degrees. And then they uh, expanded the horizontal opening to the maximum that they, they could with staying within some engineering formula and keep the costs down. So right now we can take a ship 118 feet wide with an assist tug on each side, which are about 40 to 45 feet um, wide. Extremely more efficient, safer. Everybody's taking a deep breath now and, and feeling better about it. But as they move the New Hampshire side up river to get reduce that angle, uh, it moved it to the north part of the Port Authority property, and we had a, a, a small barge dock up there. We used to have some tall ship events there and, and other things, uh, and it was very a very important part of our operation there for smaller smaller operations that didn't need to be on the main ship dock. We looked at pushing it further up river, and the further it got up the more expensive it got because there was going to have to be more in water supports for the rail, particularly the railroad bridge. So they settled on where it is and the, the railroad that comes out underneath, uh, we lost that functional uh, use of that barge dock up there. So working with New Hampshire DOT and Federal Highway, they agreed to give us a functional replacement. So we did a lot of concept studies on what were we going to do, how, is, how were we going to do something that was going to bring us back to our full operating capacity. And what we decided on was, in Federal Highway and New Hampshire DOT agreed, we were going to add 145 feet on the north end of the existing pier, especially considering now that we've rehabilitated it. We're going to add 60 feet on the south end of it, which is going to give us a, an 800-foot uh, ship dock. <clears throat> And as I said, you know, uh, the navigation channel is for a 750 plus foot vessel. So we'll have the capacity to bring those vessels in. Uh, the largest ship that we bring in now is, is only 200 meters, which is 660 feet. Um, I, I really don't, for safety reasons, I really don't allow a ship bigger than that is to dock. So we're going to do, we're going to lengthen out the dock. We have to obviously dredge the footprint where the old bridge was because it's uh, it's only 20 feet of water there at low tide. Our tractor tugs that Moran has down there are 18 <coughs> feet of water, mm -hmm. um, and the ships the ships are uh, 35 feet in draft. Where the bridge went across the property, there's a um, a hill. And that's going to be removed, and it's going to be re-sloped, so the property is all contiguous, and it's going to be paved. So we'll be uh, we'll have some more cargo area down there, and better maneuverability to handle cargos. Um, and there are some other small uh, project, uh, pieces that go with that. When the when we first looked at this in 2014, 2015, it was estimated at 19 million dollars. In 2019, Federal Highway gave, and DOT told us to go to 65% design. Um, the cost came in at $32 million. Uh, DOT asked a, a, a WSP, which is a pretty big engineering firm, uh, to do a peer review of it. Uh, they did a very extensive review, and their estimated cost was at $30 million. So there was not much of a delta between the two of them. So we were told to, to go to 100% design, and we did, and uh, 
right now today that estimated cost is about $45 million. Um, interestingly enough, yesterday we had a bid opening on that project. We had one bid. <laughs> um, the engineers are going to be looking at the bid, but the bid came in at $24 million, um, which is surprising because uh, taking into consideration the, the uh, General Sullivan Bridge, mm -hmm. that was estimated at 40. They got one bid, it came in at 80. I was scared to death that this was going to come in at $80 plus billion dollars and went the other way. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what the engineer, our, our uh, Apple Door Marine Engineering is our marine engineers of, of uh, record, so uh, we'll see what they say about it. Um, but in the long term, um, you know, we have funding in place to do this. Uh, it's long overdue, um, especially with everything that's going on uh, in the offshore wind arena. You know, there's a lot going on at other ports. Uh, where we fit into that right now, uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities there in, in support during uh, construction of offshore wind projects. Uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities afterwards in, in uh, O&M of these uh, windmills, um, if and when they build them. But there are other opportunities that we are looking at out there to, to bring in the track uh, different types of ships, different types of cargoes, and other opportunities that are out there. Um, and I will say this, you know, this, this port is my home, uh, has been for all 72 years, and uh, I, I just want to tell you that we take into consideration the community. You know, we want to be part of the community, everybody that works there is, and uh, whatever we do out there, we do take into consideration what goes on in the town. Um, so just to touch on the other uh, area that we have in the city, and that's the Portsmouth Commercial Fish Pier. Um, you know, we all read the newspapers that the industry is in crisis, which the ground fish industry in New Hampshire is. We've gone from like 35 ground fishing vessels down to about three. But a lot of the, a lot of the boats have transitioned into another fishery right now. The lobster industry is very strong uh, off the coast of New England. So we completed, two years ago, we completed a, uh, a rehabilitation of the seawall over there. Um, when, that, when that was originally built, that was mud flats. And the state bought the shoreline along the bridge above into the Pierce Island Bridge for a dollar. And then they went in and they, they brought in uh, bank run gravel and they made a coffer dam and they used that to, to uh, contain the property, and when they dredge, they put the dredge material behind the, uh, the coffer dam, and that's where the parking lot is and the building is, and they, and they built the building. Uh, and then a little bit later on, the state did get uh, a grant from the Economic Development Administration to, to lengthen that pier out. So that was built in about 1977-78. And a couple of years ago, the uh, sheet pile wall started to fail. Uh, uh, it just started to come like a zipper, just started boom, 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 boom. So I will say that uh, our, our local legislative delegation at the time was very instrumental in getting us uh, some funding to go in uh, and uh, re rebuild the wall or rebuild the, the the area behind the wall, <coughs> pretty expensive. It was, uh, an investment of $3.25 million. Uh, it's, uh, a it was a difficult project. We had to do some drilling into the ledge and put tow pins in the wall. Uh, but what we also did at the same time is we put in a whole new uh, fuel system in. Uh, one of the important parts that that facility plays over there uh, not just for the commercial fishing industry, but uh, diesel and gasoline for boats is open to the public, uh, for the uh, boating public to go over and buy it. But even more important is uh, post 9-11, uh, when all the port security started to go way up, and at, the at those times we had 24-hour patrols out on the harbor, uh, New Hampshire Marine Patrol, the Coast Guard, 
um, a lot of other three and four letter agencies. That facility is used today continuously by those agencies for uh, fueling their vessels. Portsmouth Fire Department is over there, Marine Patrol goes over there, uh, even the Police Department over at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard go over there. It's, it's open 24 hours uh, for these uh, responders to go in there. So it was important that we got that fuel system up and running for that purpose also. Um, we did advertise a bid three weeks ago where um, we had done the shore side improvements, but the wooden structure out there needed to have some work done. Um, it was interesting because when we put the seawall in, we put it in three feet out beyond the existing seawall. And in order to do that, we had to remove a row of pilings. Again, they were put in in 1977. So we took them out into the parking lot and sliced them. And the engineers looked at them and they said, those things are just as good as the day they were put in. So uh, knock on wood, that was great because I didn't have to try to find money to replace <coughs> the whole pier. So um, the plan we came up with was to go in and replace the X bracing and uh, some of the fender pilings and, and put a new wooden deck over the pier. Uh, I don't know if any of you went down during the tall ships, but the the decks beat up pretty bad. Um, the crew at the port, you know, replaces the, the uh, deck planks on a regular basis, but this is an opportunity for us to, to redeck it uh, and put new mooring hardware in and make some improvements over there. And so uh, uh, I'm hoping that the bid process next week when we open those bids comes in like this one did. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the Cliff Notes version of what we've got going on. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that the Commercial fish pier on Pierce Island is maintained and in a state of good repair to, to keep that uh, industry going. I know that Sea Grant, uh, University of New Hampshire Sea Grant, and uh, um, New Hampshire Fish and Game have statistics on the uh, economic uh, impact that the commercial fishing industry has in New Hampshire. I, I don't have those that information off the top of my head, but that is available. Uh, it's an important part. And I'll leave you with one one last uh, thing to look forward to, uh, and, and Ben and, and Sean helped me out with this. Uh, I'm, I'm on the board of directors of the Northeast Atlantic Ports Association. It's an association from the Canadian Maritimes down to the ports in Virginia, and uh, we're going to have our annual meeting here in Portsmouth uh, the 5th or something of June this coming year. These are, this is a great group of people. They all come in from all over the, the East Coast. Uh, we had our uh, annual meeting this past year up in Sydney, Nova Scotia. Uh, it's an opportunity for all of these port people to network, get the chance to talk to each other face to face and not over the phone or a Zoom call. Uh, but it's also an opportunity for uh, uh, the Port Authority to uh, Show these these other folks what we what we have here and where we're going here and um, it's a very cooperative idea sharing group. Uh, I'll get phone calls from people. Somebody will say, "Well, Rick Hendricks over at the Port of Albany told me I had to call you because it would be easier for me to bring my components into Portsmouth than it would be to go up the Hudson River to Albany." Uh, so we compete, but we're also uh, in the game together. So. I'll leave it at that, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Gina, let me first apologize for not having your PowerPoint, number one. That's I don't. But you know, right. that was I was that was a great job. But um, I, I do want to. I have a question for you, just before others are thinking of their questions. So, here at the city, we have a, a municipal services agreement with PDA. Hmm. We provide some services. Is there any anything like that here that the city provides for either the fish pier or the terminal that had you know yes okay uh, we don't have a, a, an agreement but um, <clears throat> the legislature a number of years ago uh, we have a pilot payment we pay to the city of Portsmouth thirty thousand dollars a year um, so we get the bill from the tax office once a year right now. <laughs> but one of the, one of the things that and I didn't mention this and and uh, is that we look at one of our responsibilities is to support 
um, federal agencies, municipal agencies, and state agencies in carrying out their mission. Um, and we work very closely with the Portsmouth Fire Department. Uh, we've got a, after 9-11, when, when everybody involved in the port um, there was a, did a threat assessment. And one of the things that we realized was that um, if there was an event and like an oil spill and DES had to bring in additional assets, or the Coast Guard had to bring additional assets down from headquarters in Portland, anything like that. The only all-tied boat launch ramp in the lower part of the Piscataqua River is on Pierce Island. And we're all sitting around the table going, oh boy, Market Square Day, or there's a big event at Prescott Park Art Festival. So we got uh, some federal um, Homeland Security money. We put a, a boat launch ramp inside the secured terminal uh, at the Port Authority, half a mile off of I-95 exit. But we also put in a small uh, concrete floating dock, and we provide uh, a dock space for the Portsmouth Fire Department's rescue boat. Uh, and so we've got a good relationship with uh, uh, the chief. He's a, he's a he's, well, the whole crew over there is great, but uh, Bill's been great to work with down there. Thank you. Yep. Great. Yes, sir. So we've had this question for a while. Can the pilot program handle more work? I, I had an opportunity to talk to one of them maybe seven years ago, and I was amazed that there was three. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about new uses and new opportunities coming through, how, how does that affect? Well, under the statute, uh, we're allowed to appoint as many pilots as we deem necessary. But there's, there's, a, there's the economic balance there. Is do we have enough ship traffic currently to have more pilots? One of the things we've been discussing with them since Captain Tassetta got appointed is it takes five years for somebody to be able to step up to the plate. And we've been talking about them bringing on an, an apprentice pilot. Uh, and uh, I think we'll probably be seeing that because we're all getting. We're not getting any younger. <laughs> and, uh, I know. I know. The last time I went with the pilot and I climbed up the Jacob's ladder on the side, um, I decided that uh, it was time for me to go and get that bad knee fixed. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, we we look at that quite regularly. We you know we've, we've got a good relationship with the pilots, and, and we look at um, on a monthly basis the amount of traffic and predictions of what traffic could be. And it, and it fluctuates with the seasons. So, you know, um, I, I gave a presentation to the uh, state um, uh, traffic study committee, and, and we looked at it. And so we started off with giving them some statistics about home heating oil, because that's the, you know, one of the largest uh, imports that comes into the harbor. And, uh, you know, at the time, I think it was like 135 households in the state of New Hampshire, 67% uh, of those heat with home heating oil. But Sprague and Irving deliver home heating oil to every municipality in the state from the ports within New England terminals. Uh, so how do we get all of that oil up to those households? Uh, and, and so 67% <coughs> heat with home heating oil. 80% of those get their home heating oil from Newington and Portsmouth. So how do we get that home heating oil up there? Well, anybody that drives 101, they're always paving it. So we looked at how much liquid asphalt comes in, and this in this was 2019. Um, there was enough liquid asphalt that came into the terminals to do 3,700 road lane miles, which is 12 feet by 3 inches thick pavement. So the, when do they want the home heating oil? They want it in the dead of winter time. So how do we keep those trucks that are bringing home heating oil from the terminals to the houses safe going over those roads that they paved all summer long? The rock salt that we have down on Market Street. And uh, so uh, Granite State Minerals and Morton Salt, uh, I believe they got all of the New Hampshire DOT, I think, I think Cargill got one one district up north because they have access uh, by rail from Canada with road salt. So that's just 
kind of how that all tied together. Fascinating. Jacob? Um, thanks for your presentation. It was awesome. I live right downtown, so I love watching the ships coming out, and those, yeah. those tug drivers are crazy. Um, I had a question kind of related to the cruise ship side of things or the ferry operator. We've had a few questions about cruise ships, yeah. and then specifically um, the American Cruise Line operator, who, you know, I start as soon as next year, next summer, coming to Portsmouth, at least according to their website. So I want to get a little more information on how that would work in the port with all the new activity and all that stuff. I, I'll back the train up a little bit, and... The last time, um, I, well, I can't remember the date, but the, the city um, appointed a Blue Ribbon Committee a number of years ago. And so at the time, myself and um, Captain Johnson, who was one of the pilots, um, we went in and we looked at all of the vessels operating in the Northeast Corridor. And the first thing we did was we eliminated the ones that we couldn't get under the Memorial Bridge. Uh, for example, uh, Celebrity Cruise Lines boats, uh, they have an air draft of 206 feet. Memorial Bridge is a buck and a half. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so then we looked at there were uh, two other classes. There were these mid-sized class, and the there was a and the U.S. flag coastwise vessels like um, American cruise lines. So at those mid-sized boats, they could certainly get in under the bridge. Uh, and they were like the Silver Seas or uh, those types of vessels. Very uh, exclusive. Uh, some of them are very um, all-inclusive. Uh, so their passages started at like $1,000 a day per person. Um, could have got, you know, they can get in under the bridge. The problem with them is that the criminal code in New Hampshire does not allow the possession of gambling equipment, but they made an exemption for cruise ships. And, uh, it, and what it said was, for the purposes of this section, a cruise ship shall mean a vessel whose primary purpose is touring, and has, but has overnight accommodations for 500 more people, and they have to shut the gaming equipment down when they enter the waters of the state of New Hampshire. These vessels carry 200, 250 people. And uh, um, I, I'm going to stay on the waterfront. And I'm not going to stick my toes into the statewide gambling issue. Uh, <laughs> there are folks up in Concord that I have been going on about that for a number of years. So that left us with the, the Coastwise vessels. Um, there had been uh, American Canadian Cruise Line that had been in here before. Uh, American Cruise Line had been in here. There had been a couple of other ones that uh, had come in here. Uh, American Canadian Caribbean Line uh, has been sold, uh, but uh, American Cruise Lines um, is is actually expanding. Um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to say that um, there's a representative from American Cruise Lines here. Uh, who's in the New England area on his tour, and he's just happened to, we happened to arrange for him to come down and, and come down to the terminal today and look around, and I didn't arrange it that way. Sean's, Sean's for blaming this, for inviting me to this committee. Uh, but it just, it was just per chance, and, and, and uh, when he knew that this meeting was today, he, uh, he decided to come in and as a member of the public. I've only talked to him on the phone, so I'm looking forward. After, after this meeting, we're going to go over to the terminal. Uh, they need to see what we got, where we're going. I'll give them the same talk that I did here, except that I don't have to do it a second time. And uh, <laughs> I, I'll say this to answer your question. If they want to come to Portsmouth, um, I'll, I'll welcome them with open arms. I, I, I'll just, under the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 19, it's been amended, but 1989, unless we can determine that a cargo that a vessel is carrying is hazardous or the operation that they're going to be conducting is detrimental to the property or the community or the health and welfare, I, under the law, I really have no way to, uh, to tell somebody that they can't come to our facilities if they need our requirements. Mm -hmm. um, but um, again, we like to welcome people into our city. 
I remember correctly, it's the city of the open door. <laughs> so uh, we'll see. We'll see what works out. But, you know, can you address the question about how, how people coming to your terminal, how that works with all the other activity? To, this, to is Jacob's that, question. this is something that we're going to be discussing okay. Right, okay. later on today. To be determined. Yes. Yes, I read. Gino, thanks. Really great history on the on the port. I would have um, liked to have some pictures to show you. Yeah. <laughs> Painted a great picture. I'll I'll, I'll, send I'll double after. send it. I'll double send, send it. After. And then yeah, he can send, send it out to all of you. It'll because, be in the notes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. But from uh, just for historical reference, for many of us who remember, prior to the the Sarah Long Bridge being uh, reconstructed and yeah. whatever it was, half a dozen, ten years ago, there was a cruise ship came in, hit, I believe it hit the bridge. Yep. Can you give us a little, you know, I, I, I forget the details, yep. but the size and would that would that same size boat be able to navigate it better? You know, just give us a little perspective. The, the relocation of the bridge changes the whole dynamics of that. So this, this was an American, Canadian, Caribbean line boat. I think she was a 145 feet and she had been tied up on the on the small barge dock which was on the north side of the bridge and there's a, a there's a, a little bit of an odd current there because it on an ebb tide there's a current that comes out of the uh, the North Mill Pond and pulling away from the dock I, 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 I don't want to I wasn't the federal maritime judge sitting on the case who found no, no, nothing wrong with the captains, uh, but he got a little twisted up, and the current pushed him up against the bridge. He didn't, he didn't ram into it. Just the current pushed him up there, and uh, uh, so we we called uh, Moran, and they came over with one of their tugs and pulled him off, and uh, it was. I mean, they, we went through a lot with that. The federal judge came up from Virginia and uh, actually had the hearing in here, and uh, the captain of the boat, the pilot, Dickie Holt, and myself, uh, we were required to bring our license with us, and the judge took our license, and he stood there. He says, I've been doing this a long time. He says, I know when somebody's BSing me, he says, if you try to BS me, none of you are going to get your license back again. <laughs> um, in the end result, it was uh, it was an accident. There was no uh, um, ne negligence on the captain's part. That being said, with the bridge being moved, we don't have that dock anymore, and we're going to have this 800-foot-long pier. Uh, and uh, so that that problem is mm -hmm. gone. Thank you, Sarah. Um. Again, I want to echo everybody's thanks to you for coming with your presentation. And given all the infrastructure improvements and the self-funding nature of the port, what do you see as the most uh, profitable opportunities that are coming in uh, to the port to be able to sustain economically? Um, generally, my clients ask for confidentiality, and I, I talking with them, they, they, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Sorry. But, but I'm, I'm assuming that in prioritizing the, the kinds of business that happens at the port, you have to look at the economics of self-funding and prioritize the profitability. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Should we? Yeah. Just uh, if there's any other questions for Gino. Uh, if I could. Uh, hi, Gino. Yeah. Been a long time. Um, I thought you were going to tell us we might have a slurry pipeline coming in or something. <laughs> That's an inside joke. You had yeah, been yeah. around a long <laughs> <Yeah>. time. <laughs> um, uh, logistically, uh, if if uh, cruise ships were to come in, they would have to use the terminal pier, right? I mean, there's no other place for them to dock. Um, right now, no. Um, but I, I won't. I won't speak for the owners of uh, the Schiller Station. Uh, as you know, the power plant's been closed down a number of years, and uh, they're, they're looking at opportunities up there just as we're looking for opportunities down here. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious as to how it would work if you have other ships coming in 
um, how do you coordinate the different users of the port, particularly if you have, you know, like cruise ships have to stay on a certain timeline. They can't sit out in the, uh, off the, off the uh, mouth of the river for two days while the pier opens up. So how, how do you do that now where you get conflicting users, and how would you do it with cruise ships? Um, well, we've got two different salt companies here. We've got uh, Eastern Minerals and uh, and uh, Morton Salt there, and um, sometimes it's it's a race, and whoever gets here first, <laughs> as far as the, as far as bulk cargo goes. Right. Uh, with the passenger business, I know they have a schedule, and um, we we would work around that schedule if we make a commitment to them. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, one last thing. Um, uh, one of the things that I did when I took this job was I took the cloak of secrecy off that port terminal down there. Uh, it's owned by the people of the state of New Hampshire. It's in your fair city. Uh, I know Council Lombardi has taken advantage of coming down there and uh, seeing what's going on. Uh, the invitation is open anytime. If you're driving by, you see a boat down there, you want to come and see what it is. Uh, Pull in, pull in. If I'm there, I'll, I'll take you down. Uh, um, or if you call me up and say, Gino, next time you get a salt ship in, can you give me a call? Uh, please. Um, we've got a great facility there. We're making improvements to it. Uh, it's part of our history and our culture. Uh, and I love talking about it. You better if I had some pictures, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean and I have know, known each other a long time, so <laughs> jab him a little. Thank, Thank you, Gino. Thank you. Council Lombardi, maybe one more. I, I would just have to say, going down on that dock, you know, that pier, and standing five, six feet from the edge and watching those pilots put a ship that size against that pier was really impressive. Yeah. Really impressive. And I, I just yep. have great respect for those pilots. Yep. So you're welcome to come down, please. Thank you. Okay, Bob. Um, well, one of the reasons you're here is because of a request from uh, a resident for information about cruise ship yep. uh, business. So uh, do you see an increase in demand from that? Industry uh, over the you know it, well in the future or uh, and do you see us being able to accommodate them uh, better uh, in the future as things progress and as you do improvements down there? Um, I I can't I can't answer that question right now, Bob, because I haven't had an opportunity to sit. <laughs> Talk to my new friend over there, but um, perhaps you'd like to weigh in on it. <laughs> we, uh, Public, you know, uh, comment. There's, there's a, there's, there's a, there are fluctuations in the industry, like everything. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what's the market? <clears throat> the market available. Uh, different, different line in the past. I mean, I worked in that industry in the past, and we made stops in places not because there was something there that was attractive to the passengers, but that particular company was looking for a, a, a new market that they could draw off of. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody wants to come to Portsmouth because of what we've got to offer, you know. So we're, we're in the city of the open door, we have the port of the open mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So that we get time to get the public comment. I just want to thank you for, for your time. That was exceptional. My pleasure. Um, Again, fantastic. please uh, take the opportunity to come over. Thank you for that. Gina. Thank you. Appreciate thank you, it. Okay, great. So next, we do have public comments. So uh, if anyone who's here uh, uh, enjoying the rest of our meeting wants to come and speak or uh, bring anything to the commission, we'd welcome that. Um, given that, we've got uh, our next meeting scheduled for December 1st, uh, first Friday of the month. We will continue to stick to that. Um, so hopefully that's in everyone's calendar, and we look forward to seeing you then. Yeah, so and that's at the high school. At the high school. Right. Yeah, so we're going to be visiting oh, our CTE, and I believe the start time is going to be 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Yes. Sleep in. Yeah. <laughs> Extra half hour for your Friday in these dark Will morning. the end time shift to 930? 
I Are we still having an hour and a half meeting? I just need to plan around other meetings. Thanks. I expect it will, so Thank we you. can make accommodations. Certainly recognize it's pushing out on schedule. We, we not only will hear from CTE, but David Cho will be giving us a commercial real estate update as well. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the students start later this year than last year, so that that's why yeah. you want no, to. No, it's fine. Just want to plan ahead because I think last time I wasn't clear that it was going to be an hour and a half. Cool. Yeah, so just want to confirm. And then uh, just for, for uh, everyone to continue to be thinking about um, topics for January, and, and uh, Tom and I will be looking at dates and hope to bring that to the group um, by the time we meet in December so that we can be planning ahead and reserving schedules uh, over and above our typical January meeting if we're going to take that approach. So stay tuned. Um, any other business to bring forward that not covered? Okay, great. Well, again, uh, thank you, Gino. That was that was uh, exceptional. We appreciate your time and uh, entertaining our peppering you with questions. It was really helpful and, and fascinating. Uh, My pleasure. Given that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any, in, any seconds? Sure. Okay. Second. Right, I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Aye. Thank you.